Good afternoon, friends. Uh, thank you, Akshanda. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be presenting uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I will be talking about uh, screening diagnosis and management of uh, osteoporosis. Uh, it's an extensive to topic, and I hope to uh, touch most of the uh, relevant issues. So we all know that osteoporosis is a, is a disease characterized by low bone mass and deterioration in the microarchitecture of the bone. Uh, which results in uh, weakening of the bone uh, tissue. Uh, bone strength is equivalent to the bone mineral density uh, along with the bone quality. Uh, it's typically the, the women who are most affected, not that more, uh, men are spared, but women who are in the postmenopausal age group tend to have deterioration in their bone quality and they, they tend to catch up with osteoporosis much earlier than men. Men tend to uh, be affected beyond their 70s and even uh, 75. Uh, and hence, this is the age group that we should target. Any, anyone who's uh, beyond the post menopausal age group. In the Indian scenario, it is, uh, it, is to be, it, it is to be done, I would rather say, uh, in, in the 50s rather than the 60s. Uh, and these recommendations have been endorsed by uh, majority of the societies based on guidelines. Uh, which are uh, which have been found to be cost effective for uh, uh, these age groups. So uh, all women beyond the age of uh, 65 should be screened. Younger postmenopausal women who have risk factors uh, also need to be uh, to be looked at. And uh, women who have a have an insufficiency fracture uh, after the age of 50 again are included in the high risk group. Uh, with the newer diagnostic modalities, women uh, younger than 65 who have a higher 10-year fracture risk uh, ratio uh, are also included in the screening category. Let's look at the various different tools that are available in uh, treating osteoporosis or in, in identifying osteoporosis. We all know about the BRAC score and this basically looks, uh, uses the clinical factors with or without uh, the use of the femoral neck DMD to look at the 10-year probability of having a major osteoporotic fracture. A major osteoporotic fracture is defined as uh, one affecting either the hip, the vertebrae, the humerus, or the wrist. Or the wrist. So Braxco looks at the risk of developing a fracture in the next 10 years, and it basically involves use of a questionnaire with some standard questions looking at the age, uh, the weight of the patient, uh, the height, uh, previous history of fracture, uh, especially the hip, any risk factors including smoking, uh, use of steroids, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, any factors which can contribute to secondary osteoporosis, uh, use of alcohol, and finally the femoral bone mineral density. And this helps us. Uh, uh, define the fracture risk. Now it derives a 10-year probability of a clinical event which can uh, result in a fracture. This, uh, this score has been uh, internationally recognized and validated and it is based on multiple cohorts and it is not just applicable to uh, say the Caucasian or the African uh, population. It has been uh, validated in the Indian as well as the Asian population. Uh, it basically helps us identify uh, not just the patients who are at risk, but also patients who uh, need aggressive treatment for fracture prevention. Uh, some of the limitations of tax score include uh, that it is not valid for patients who are being treated. It only looks at, uh, uh, at the DMD of the hip. Uh, there is no yes, uh, the, the, as far as the risk factors are concerned, it just looks at yes and no. So if someone is on uh, low dose steroids, it is still being uh, looked at the same risk factors as to someone who is having high dose steroids. And it just includes the major osteoporotic fracture, and that does not necessarily mean that all the, all the fractures are included. And uh, the clinician should never forget, forget his or her own judgment in deciding the fracture risk. Uh, there's another tool called the osteoporosis self assessment tool. Which, uh, which is basically a mathematical formula. And it looks at the weight of the patient uh, minus the age divided by five. And it helps uh, 
generate the risk score. The lower the score, uh, the higher the risk of uh, osteoporosis. So if the score is less than 2, uh, then it is uh, as good as 90% sensitive and up to 50% specific for identifying osteoporosis in the postmenopausal age group. Uh, let's move on to some of the imaging techniques uh, which can help us uh, define osteoporosis. Uh, the, the usual ones include uh, the DEXA scan, which is uh, typically used across the board. Uh, we also have the cheaper options which are used in CAMPS, uh, which includes the ultrasonic, uh, ultrasonic uh, method. Then uh, you have a quantitative CT and the uh, bone morphometric measurements. What is DEXA scan? It is, uh, it is basically the bone mineral density that is calculated by the ratio of the bone mineral content in a major area. Uh, it provides a surrogate measure of the bone mass. Uh, it should be understood that the area that is scanned is in two dimensions and it is not in three dimensions unlike the, unlike the CT scan. It is something which involves very low dose of radiation. It is quick, uh, very little scatter and it is, I would say, the most popular uh, and accurate test to determine osteoporosis, uh, which can be done in a short period of time. So uh, a DEXA score report typically shows a T-score and a Z-score. T-score is the number of, of the standard deviation that the measurement is above or below a young normal. So you are basically comparing the, the score of the patient to a young normal individual, and that is what is important in our clinical practice. The z-score is the number uh, wherein you compare the, the score of the patient with the age-matched mean. Uh, it is uh, something which can be used uh, in younger patients and in patients where we are looking at a possible secondary osteoporosis. So for all practical purposes in our practice, what we need to look at is the t-score. Uh, what are the sites that uh, we use to measure osteoporosis? Uh, typically, it's the proximal femur, femur and the neck area. It is the lumbar spine. And in, in certain scenarios, we look at the lower end of the radius as well. Uh, so DEXA reading is proportional to the amount of X-ray that is absorbed by the bone. It can only tell us how much calcium we have in, in the bone. And it cannot really tell us the uh, how the calcium is arranged or, or what is the microstructure of the bone. So uh, it does not give us an idea of the bone quality per se. It is just looking at the amount of calcium that we have in the two-dimensional area. Uh, some other limitations, it cannot help us distinguish between cortical and trabecular bone. Uh, it also does not help us discriminate between changes due to bone geometry and uh, uh, and this, this is very relevant in the lumbar spine where you have arthritic changes on the end plates and uh, the DEXA can, uh, can be misled to, to uh, feel as if the bone is fairly dense uh, in contrast to uh, areas which are very osteoporotic. So you would have a contrasting picture and the, the computer in the DEXA would just read the, the stronger part of the bone or the sclerotic part of the bone. Also, we are not really able to define the microstructural characteristics which are identified better in certain other uh, group of investigations. So, uh, moving on to quantitative CT, which is, uh, which is uh, very rarely used, but it is a much more precise volumetric analysis of the bone mineral density. So, it looks at the three-dimensional bone mineral density. Yeah. It can uh, separately determine the bone mineral density in the trabecular as well as the cortical bone and also define the geometry. Uh, the advantages include that it can be performed at an axial as, as well as peripheral sites. It can uh, be calculated by using the, the CT machines that we routinely have uh, and it just excludes the other structures which can come into the picture like the fat, the muscle, and the air. Uh, some of the shortcomings include that the radiation dose is much higher than a DEXA scan. Uh, availability of CT scan could be an issue, and it is a less standardized practice, and it is more operator dependent. Uh, so peripheral uh, quantitative CT uh, is a variant of the uh, quantitative CT which allows us to measure 
the bone marrow density in peripheral sites like the radius. Again, it is a volumetric measurement. It determines the geometry of the bone, and uh, and it is still in the in the earlier stages. And we really need uh, more clinical practice to uh, to get uh, to get to know how it is to be used in in the clinical scenarios. But yes, it can definitely be useful in scenarios where we have implants, either in the spine or in the hip, where doing the, the usual GMP uh, using the DEXA device is difficult. So uh, there have been some certain uh, certain articles which are looking at the radiographic assessment, uh, and they basically define the semi-quantitative visual grading of the vertebral deformities. Uh, it's a fairly detailed study. What I'm going to just look at is Based on the uh, based on the type of deformity, it can either be a wedge deformity or a bipunctate deformity or a uniform flash deformity, and that could be graded into mild, moderate, and severe. And that itself can uh, define the fracture grade, whether a uh, particular patient has a severe fracture or a mild fracture. Again, uh, just a different way of doing things. We can also have a quantitative morphometric uh, analysis of the vertebral fractures, wherein uh, six points are, are, are placed on the vertebra and uh, these points are measured by a trained reader to get some definitive, um, definitive measurements and then fractures can be identified based on uniformly applied objective criteria. Uh, again, this has its own limitations wherein the magnification can be different for different groups. Uh, there can be a lack of uniformity between the readers as someone may decide to pick certain set of points as compared to others. Again, it has not been validated for uh, different cases and ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, type if based on their anatomical variations. So quantitative CT uh, basically looks at the density, the structure, and the strength of the bone. It helps us uh, measuring the bone mass as well as density. It helps us define the bone microstructure uh, as well as the mic microstructure. And it is one of the fewer ways of determining the bone strength in contrast to the other, uh, other criteria. Uh, micro CT is something which looks at, uh, look at, looks at the microscopic structure in small areas. The resolution is as small as one uh, micromillimeter to uh, 100 micromillimeters. And it is a rapid non-destructive imaging technique for determining uh, uh, the, the, the microscopic uh, density of uh, specimens uh, in a non-invasive fashion. Again, it is not something which has been uh, used commonly. And as of now, it is mostly used for research purposes. And I would uh, I would say it is beyond the scope of a talk to go into the details of this particular technique. Uh, we have dynamic hist histomorphometric measurements wherein we are uh, trying to look at the bone turnover in addition to the bone structure. We can use uh, things like techniques like tetracycline labeling. As we all remember, tetracycline is taken up by the bone very easily, and that could be used to label the bones to uh, to kind of uh, give us a contrast and uh, give us various uh, microstructures uh, in, in a more uh, refined fashion. So this this is just an example of doing the micro CT for the radius, where you can actually look at the the cortical as well as cancerous bone, along with the density and the uh, and the structure of the bone, and this is a fairly fairly detailed as well as uh, specific uh, way of identifying the bone density in a three-dimensional fashion. Uh, moving over to the quantitative ultrasound, this is one of the cheapest and the easiest available technique to look at uh, the bone density. It uses the uh, piezoelectric effect uh, to identify the bone uh, density by passing the ultrasonic pulse to typically the heel bone. Uh, the heel is kept in the center of, uh, of this machine after applying some gel and uh, that is how the measurements are done. The advantages are obviously the portability, the low cost, no radiation and the ease of use. But it is not the most specific uh, way of uh, identifying uh, identifying uh, rather not a very sensitive way of identifying the bone density. We are just looking at the peripheral bone here, and the sensitivity is pretty low. It is much more specific 
as based on the studies that have been provided. In these two particular studies, that the, sensi uh, the sensitivity was as good as 40%, uh, but the specific specificity was much higher in defining the bone density. So uh, the common techniques that are being used are basically the DEXA scan and the ultrasonic technology. There are some new uh, devices which are uh, which are using ultrasonic technology like the eco light, which can help define the bone mineral density in the in the spine. Again, uh, these are still evolving and this uh, beyond the scope of this talk to look at the details of these uh, techniques. Again, hopefully we have these techniques uh, available uh, in, in, a, uh, in, in our daily scenarios that will help uh, reduce the radiation as well as the ease of doing, uh, doing these measurements. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, just a busy slide, just looking at the advantages and the disadvantages of using a, using a particular technique. As we know, uh, DEXA has a high accuracy. Uh, it is looking at the relevant sites, which is the spine and the hip, which are the most relevant. And we have several studies which are validating uh, the, the, the measurements. Uh, the cons are the cost, the variation, and the, and the ability to not to differentiate between particular as well as cortical bone. Uh, quantitative CT is the true way of determining the density of the bone, but it involves high radiation and the accessibility is very limited. Quantitative ultrasound is a quick, cheap radiation free option, but uh, we still don't have uh, standardized guidelines and it can only be used at peripheral uh, anatomical sites. Uh, moving on, uh, let's look at the management options in osteoporosis, uh, now that we have looked at the screen. Uh, so when looking at any patient who needs treatment of osteoporosis, we need to identify uh, the risk factors. Typically for any disease, say like the cardiac, uh, cardiac age group or for that matter the diabetic age group, we need to understand what are the risk factors, either modifiable and non-modifiable. So age, sex, uh, including the hormonal, uh, hormonal issues in, uh, in the women, uh, history of previous risk factors, family history, uh, the, the race and the uh, presence of rheumatoid arthritis are obviously non-modifiable risk factors and they play a major role in, uh, in deciding whether one is going to be prone for osteoporosis. On the other hand, the modifiable ones which we need to stress on and which we need to counsel the patients as well as the treating physicians who are involved in the care include physical activity, the use of steroid medicines, nutrition, uh, the amount of protein in the diet, as well as uh, vitamin deficiencies, uh, use of uh, heavy metals, uh, the rate of the patient, surprisingly patients who are on the heavier side. So one of the advantages of being on the heavier side is that you are at a, at a, letter, uh, at a, at a lesser risk of developing osteoporosis. Uh, similarly, patients who are into endurance training are protected from it. On the other side, smoking and alcohol both, uh, alcohol, especially in excessive amounts, uh, can both uh, make uh, make an individual prone for osteoporosis. Moving over, uh, identifying the patients. We have already look at, looked at the screening tool, the bone mineral density by using DEXA, identifying the risk factors and the, uh, and the track score. Uh, there are also some other risk assessment tools which I could, uh, which I could uh, find. I thought I should share with you all. Uh, basically, uh, if, we, if we multiply the bone mineral density by the age, and depending on the score that we get, if the score is less than 100, then we are looking at a minimal risk of osteoporosis. But if the score is between uh, between uh, between 150 or other more than 200, then you are looking at a high risk for osteoporosis. Uh, and uh, this is an easy way of at least looking at, uh, at patients uh, uh, who have osteoporosis. And the bone mineral density that we uh, that we use for uh, these uh, measurements. Should uh, should not be the aggregate. It should be the lowest. So, if, for for example, if the if the uh, radius is minus 2.4 and the uh, hip is minus 2.2 and the spine is minus 2.8, then you should be looking at minus 2.8 and not the not the better scores or the average scores. Uh, so, as uh, as we have known, uh, any fracture, especially so in the spine, increases the risk of a subsequent fracture. And as you can see, if you have a 
a first or a second or a third fracture, then you are increasing the risk of developing further fractures. I am sure you all must have seen elderly patients, especially females in their 80s, who have multiple compression fractures and who are miserable because of the pain that they have. So this can very well explain the, the cascade which, which results into an uh, increased risk for a fracture. And it has a tremendous effect on the quality of life as well as the mobility of the patient. Moving over to the, to the tests that need to be done. To, uh, to screen uh, the patients, for, not, not screen, but to kind of evaluate the patients better for osteoporosis. We should be looking at the serum calcium levels, phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase basically looks at the bone activity. Serum creatinine to find out how the kidney function is. Uh, protein, total protein and albumin levels, along with vitamin D levels. Uh, doing a CBC is helpful. Uh, as you know that when we are looking at patients with back pain, especially as a result of a compression fracture, we should have the other causes of a compression fracture in mind, and that include a metastatic secondary, as well as uh, as well as uh, something like uh, multiple myeloma, where you would have a picture where the calcium levels are high, the kidney function is is of course uh, impaired, protein levels are high and uh, you would have a high ESR with anemia, and those are the patients where you may need to change tracks and look at uh, identifying the cause of this fracture, which basically involves using, using the serum electrophoresis. Again, this is beyond the, uh, score, beyond the, beyond the, uh, uh, the, the talk, but we, we should not be blind towards identifying other pathological risk factors for osteoporosis, which can have long-term implications. So this is a very good master chart, which looks at uh, the algorithmic approach towards, uh, towards uh, assessing patients who have osteoporosis. When we are dealing with uh, patients who, who are to be screened for osteoporosis and who are identified with those scores, then the, the next thing that we should do is perform baseline investigations. I have already enumerated those. Uh, of course, fine and chest x should be done just to, just to rule out any obvious pathological fractures or uh, findings. Uh, the next thing that we look at is uh, a certain set of special investigations depending on what you're looking at. We already discussed the most common scenario that is multiple myeloma where you need to do serum electrophoresis, urine for Bain Jones proteins. If we have a secondary uh, metastasis, we are looking at a biopsy. If we are looking at a thyroid malfunction, then we are we need to identify that. Uh, then once we have identified the, the, the patients who are who are basically dealing with primary osteoporosis, we need to uh, we need to define the further set of treatment. Uh, and this includes uh, patients who continue to be, to be symptomatic, especially in the spine where uh, uh, where palliative options like vertebroblastic can be offered. Uh, we also need to define the risk of developing a, a major osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years, this, which is basically the FRAC score. And beyond that, uh, we need to offer the usual treatment. Once we have identified the patients who have primary osteoporosis without a fracture, we need to, uh, we need to offer them treatment. Again, uh, the treatment that needs to be offered, I'll be discussing it in detail in the next few slides. Uh, finally, uh, these patients also need to be offered counseling in terms of uh, their diet, in terms of regular weight bearing or resistance exercises, and uh, refraining from uh, other things like tobacco as well as alcohol. And finally, last, last but not the least, a regular follow up in terms of repeating their DEXA levels uh, in the femur and the lumbar spine at two years, which is basically the minimum time that can, that can be given for any treatment to act and improve the quality of the board. So this is again another uh, algorithm chart where we are looking at uh, stratifying the treatment based on what the DEXA scores are. Uh, typically the way I look at things is patients who are up to minus one basically have a normal DEXA score and do not need any significant pharmacological treatment. They should be offered uh, a lifestyle uh, wherein they maintain their uh, healthy bone, so basically regular exercises uh, adequate vitamin D calcium intake as well as uh, as well as uh, uh, 
understanding uh, the preventive measure in terms of worsening of osteoporosis. But patients who are in the, into the minus 1 to minus uh, 2.4 uh, group need to basically uh, understand that they have a high risk of uh, progressing to osteoporosis and hence uh, need to be offered some pharmacologic treatment and this, in, this typically includes the allotronic uh, preparations. On the other hand, patients who have scores beyond minus 2.5 need to be uh, offered uh, a treatment uh, which is much more aggressive which basically involves anabolic agents. So uh, looking at the basic steps, uh, diet should involve high calcium and vitamin D intake. So uh, all, all uh, components which can offer you high calcium, milk and milk products, some of the nuts, uh, as well as sardines, uh, cheese, uh, avoiding caffeinated products. So not just coffee but also uh, soft drinks which are caffeinated. Uh, we have discussed exercise, uh, stopping smoking and alcohol. So these are some of the uh, charts for the required daily allowance and typically the way I remember things is 1000 milligrams is what is 1000 to 1200 milligrams is what is adequate for most of the age groups who come, come into the high risk category. Uh, again moving over to vitamin D, it is about 600 international units which is needed as a required daily allowance. You can either do it on a daily basis or you can do it on a weekly or a monthly basis depending on the convenience of the patient. But uh, this is what is needed for the body. Uh, moving over to the alendronates or the anti resorptive agents. Uh, as uh, in contrast to the anabolic agents, we need to understand the, uh, the mechanism of action. One, yeah, one targets the osteoblasts, which basically break down bone while the other targets the osteoblasts by promoting bone formation. Uh, there are other options like hormonal replacement therapy, raloxifen, and then denizumab. Again, raloxifen and HRT are beyond my, uh, my scope of understanding because these are mostly the domain of a, of a obstetrician or a gynecologist or for that matter, uh, or rather a physician. But uh, typically, in my practice, being an orthopedic spine surgeon, I typically look at either of the two agents along with calcium vitamin D. Denosumab is a, is, a, is a drug which is to be selectively used in certain group of patients, and you need to understand uh, the indications properly. It is always helpful to take the help of a physician, especially an endocrinologist, in using these high end medicines because it has its own implications. So, uh, in uh, the menopausal group, you are looking at higher resorption rate as compared to the bone formation and that's where you are looking at a negative balance. And this results in a loss of the bone mass as well as strength, making one prone to fractures. What this phosphonates do is basically reduce the resorption rate while the bone building continues to be the same and we are trying to achieve a, a net uh, positive uh, balance. So, as, as I discussed, uh, it reduces the number of osteoclasts, thus reducing the uh, bone resorption. Uh, the osteoclasts still continue to do some resorption, but it is much less. As a result, the net bone turnover uh, leads to increased mineralization. Uh, a number of calendonic preparations are available. What to offer and how to offer uh, depends on, on the patient uh, as well as the, uh, the clinician's uh, preferences. Uh, there are convenient weekly as well as monthly preparations available which should be taken orally. There are yearly preparations available which can be given intravenously. Uh, no one preparation is more effective or safer than others for all practical purposes. You just need to understand what are the requirements of your patients and, and then offer the appropriate treatment to your patient. Uh, the side effects as well as the way it needs to be used needs to be understood. The treatment for uh, this phosphonate should typically be continued for two to four years. You can extend it for five years. Uh, they tend to, uh, so, they, uh, so you can extend it in some limited indicated uh, limited indications, but typically three to four years is the upper limit. They tend to increase the bone density uh, as well as decrease the rate of fractures quite significantly. As we discussed, we need to understand the contraindications. So. Uh, one of the contraindications that, that I come across in my practice is post spinal fusion. Although there are contrasting studies, but for all practical purposes, when I have performed the spinal fusion and put in a lot of bone graft, I try to protect it. And because uh, these uh, 
medicines have an effect on the osteoblasts which are important in maturing the fusion mass. Uh, using uh, using this phosphorus in the first three months is not, not a good idea. That is where I refrain from using those. But in other patients or in patients who had a fusion which is well healed, we can very well use those. Patients who have kidney problems uh, or who have a GI problem in the form of the uh, esophageal stricture or uh, 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 esophageal ulcer should not be offered these medicines. Similarly, patients who are hypocalcemic should not be offered because that, that can uh, make them go for further decrease in the calcium levels. These patients uh, should be offered optimal amount of calcium and vitamin D in their diet so that they have a good intake which is necessary for, uh, for bone buildup. Uh, the, the adverse effects include esophageal irritation, which is the most common problem that I have, uh, I have faced in my practice. The patients need to be made aware of how the drug needs to be taken, the precautions that need to be followed. That includes uh, making the patient sit up or carry on with the activities rather than sleeping after the in, uh, intake of the drug. The, patient, the drug needs to be taken on, a, on an empty stomach with plenty of water. And patient needs to refrain from having any food articles for the next hour or two. Uh, there are certain scenarios where, uh, where we need to be very cautious. And uh, this includes patients who are in for dental extraction. Uh, there have been instances of developing osteonecrosis of the, of the mandible as well as maxilla in patients who have had a dental extraction and who were on alindronate. So patients need to be made aware of these things. Certain patients who have used alindronate for a longer period of time, beyond three years, have developed insufficiency fracture in the subprochantic peri area of the femur. And uh, that is the reason uh, the, the, the recent studies are suggesting to limit the use up to three years. Beyond that, if, if the patient needs to use it, he or she needs to go on a therapeutic holiday for a couple of years before you can consider these medicines. Moving over to the, uh, to the other agents which are commonly used in the practice, uh, and that includes teriparatide, which is basically an anabolic uh, bone building agent. And how does it work? It basically increases the rate at which the bone is built. Uh, the bone resorption also increases, but the net uh, increase is in the bone building, and that is where you have a positive balance. How does it work? It, uh, uh, it has been shown that teriparatide has, uh, has a stimulation effect on the osteoblast, uh, which helps in the proliferation and, and differentiation of these cells which results in bone formation. And that is how uh, we are looking at uh, making new bone in, in these patients. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a schematic picture we can, which can help you understand uh, the mechanism much better. And uh, as, as I said, osteoblasts are directly activated, resulting in bone formation. Um, Teleparatide also has a stimulation effect on the osteoblast, osteoblasts, but it is not as much as the osteoblast, and that results in a positive bone balance, and the new bone is formed along the cortical surfaces. So advantages include improved bone mineral density in the hips and the spines, which in turn reduces the risk of uh, new vertebral fractures, especially in patients who already have those fractures, and also reduces the risk of the peripheral or the non vertebral fracture, which that includes the hips, the wrists, as well as, uh, as, well as the peripheral bones. Now, uh, teriparatide is an extremely safe uh, a drug, but it, used, it needs to be used with certain precautions. Uh, you need to identify the patients who are safe in terms of using this drug. So, because it is an anabolic agent and it has a stimulant effect on, on the cells, it cannot be used in patients who have had a history of. Uh, a malignancy, especially that involving the bone, wherein uh, there was bone destruction, because uh, this can have a gap, have an acceleration effect on the bone destruction process. Similarly, patients who are having hyperparathyroidism or hypercalcemia needs to be need to stay away from this drug, uh, along with patients who have chronic kidney disease and high uric acid levels. Uh, the usual side effects that I have observed in my practice include just mild skin reactions. Patients have also uh, experienced some bone pain, and the best way of dealing with these uh, issues is to make sure that the patients uh, 
patients are well hydrated uh, when they are especially started on the on the deliberate regime because uh, uh, we have seen patients having a low hydration and uh, some of these symptoms uh, to exist together. Uh, the risk of osteosarcoma has been shown in uh, in certain animals, but has not been proved uh, in uh, in any of the uh, any of the human studies that have been carried out. Uh, what is the optimal duration of therapy? Uh, patients need to be offered uh, therapy treatment uh, to the optimal uh, optimal period. And uh, if we go to the next slide, this is this very beautifully. Uh, uh, describes how the effect uh, goes on. As you can see, uh, the predominant effect is in the first uh, 12 months, but there is a significant residual effect up to almost two years, beyond 18 months, and that is where uh, the two-year treatment period is understood. We, we, we know that we can use teriparatide only once, and we need to use it optimally in well-screened uh, patients so that they can get the best benefit out of, out of uh, this drug. So what are the indications? Patients with severe osteoporosis, and uh, the way it is defined is patients who have a T-score beyond minus 2.5, or patients who have osteopenia, so scores between minus 1 to minus 2.5, but who have a history of uh, fragility fracture. Uh, patients who also are not responding to this phosphonates can be considered. And uh, patients who have had implant failures, uh, secondary to osteoporosis, are also to be, to be considered, because as I said, when you're looking at fusions, you cannot really use this phosphorus because of certain uh, qualities that they have. Uh, what are the investigations that need to be performed? Uh, we need to look at uh, their calcium, their phosphorus levels, and their alkaline phosphatase levels, their kidney function in the form of serum creatinine, thyroid stimulate uh, the TSH to look at their thyroid function, vitamin D levels, and parathyroid hormone levels. Uh, we just need to do a CBC ESR just to make sure we are not dealing with a certain other group of uh, diseases, so it's always safer to have this baseline investigations to screen your patients. And in patients who have a normal profile as far as these investigations are concerned, it is safe to start teriparatide uh, even in the hands of orthopedic surgeon or, uh, or people of, uh, of different special specialties. And you don't necessarily need to go and meet an endocrinologist. Of course, patients who have secondary osteoporosis or have an altered uh, parameter as far as these investigations are concerned, it is always safer to get an endocrinologist involved. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, one, of the, one of the prominent uh, products as far as teriparatide is Portio, and you all must have seen the Portio pen, which is used to deliver the, the 20 microgram shot uh, in these patients. And, uh, um, Basically, this is a standardized uh, uh, standardized uh, device which can help uh, offer or which can help provide this, this, the appropriate dose. Again, uh, there is always a question, especially under Indian conditions, as to whether uh, the generic alternatives are equally effective or not. Uh, again, it, it, you, you should not look at a drug in isolation, you really need to understand the other factors that are involved, including the ability of, of uh, the patients to be trained, as well as the whole chain that needs to be uh, brought into, into a picture when you are going to offer this drug to the patients. Uh, and uh, a holistic view of, of all these factors, as well as the patient's ability to afford these medicines need to be considered. But at this point of time, uh, it appears that uh, the, the original product seems to serve most of these purposes and should be offered to the patients who can, who can afford it. Uh, so you have basically, uh, we, we have basically looked at uh, the various different uh, treatment options that are available. In, uh, for all practical purposes, we are either looking at calcium vitamin D, uh, along with either an anti-resorptive agent or a bone forming agent, depending on what the, what the BMD is. And uh, the choice of the data, uh, patient depends basically on, their, on the BMD as well as the fracture of developing the fracture, uh, the risk, and the risk of developing the fracture. And this needs to be understood by the clinician as well as patient, so that uh, a successful treatment uh, outcome can be achieved. Uh, so uh, to, to summarize, uh, 
early diagnosis is the, is the key in treating the osteoporosis successfully. Uh, DEXA is the most commonly used uh, screening option which has been validated across uh, in identifying the bone density. Uh, the important limit limitations include the cost as well as the low dose of radiation which, uh, which it involves. Ultrasonic devices are uh, available but as of now uh, although they are cheap they are still uh, not as reliable as the DEXA. Hopefully in the future we have more, uh, more refined refined devices which can give us equally good measurements. As far as the medical management is concerned, uh, high index, index of suspicion is the key in preventing complications like fractures. Uh, EMD is the key in deciding the treatment that needs to be offered. Non-pharmacologic agents form the foundation of treatment, but the pharmacologic strategies need to be refined so that the patient can be optimally treated depending on his or her requirements. And as I said, the choice of pharmacologic agent depends on the DMD as well as the presence or absence of fragility fractures. I would like to thank you for your attention uh, and I will be happy to take uh, questions uh, from, from the audience. Again, thank you for your time and your patience. Over to now you, Akshan. Going, now going with the questions. First question from Mukul. Do you differentiate the use of biphosphonate usage based on first fracture site? So uh, they are they are basically trying to Ashanta, can you hear me? I guess. Yeah, so, yes, you uh, can answer the question. So depending on the fracture site. Yes. Uh, I think if you are actually dealing with a with a fracture, then I think the patient is already in the category where uh, where uh, you are in the group where you need an anabolic agent rather than a rather than a bisphosphonate. So uh, to answer this question, uh, I don't think it makes a difference as to where the where the fracture is and what bisphosphonate needs to be used. In my practice, a patient who already has a fragility fracture, irrespective of what his bone mineral, mineral density is, is an candidate for is a candidate for uh, eriperitone, unless there is a specific uh, contraindication. Next question from Prerna: How is osteoporosis different in men and women? Which one faces more issues? That's a very good question. Uh, so in, in our scenario, osteoporosis is uh, much, uh, happens much early in women because uh, the typical age for menopause in Indian women is between 45 to uh, 45 to 50 years. So they are going to be hit by osteoporosis by 55, 60. On the contrary, in men, the testosterone, which has a protective effect, uh, 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 Pulse is still almost 70-75. So it is beyond 70-75 that the men are going to face osteoporosis. So we are looking at a much later uh, age group in men as compared to the women. Next question from Vishal. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the difference between osteoporosis and osteopenia? Okay, so osteopenia. So in simplistic terms, Osteopenia is uh, still a weakened bone, but is not is not weak enough to be in the in the severe category. So your bone mineral density is not optimal as far as the density uh, in in a particular surface area is concerned. But it is not uh, worse enough to put you at a high risk of fracture. So anything beyond minus 2.5 is osteoporosis. Anything between minus 1 to minus 2.5 is osteopenia. I think that's the easiest and the simplest way of defining uh, the two uh, different types. Next question from Preeti. Osteoporosis is a common condition in both the aging male and female populations. Does it can mm -hmm. also occur in childhood or early stages? Uh, uh, that's that's a uh, that's an interesting question. It can happen in younger individuals, but the causes can be uh, 
can, can be much more complicated. So that is why we, we call it as secondary osteoporosis. Uh, these are patients who have some pathological factors which are contributing to the osteoporosis like say impaired kidney function or say high parathyroid hormone levels. Typically these patients need to be evaluated by an endocrinologist and uh, treated accordingly. It is not the typical primary osteoporosis. Next question from Sana Sheikh. How reliable are the BMD tests done through ultrasound? Again, a very good question. It's a good, uh, it's a good screening modality. It is uh, quite specific where it is positive, but it is not very uh, sensitive. So you could very well miss a lot of patients who have osteoporosis, but uh, who could not be detected uh, based on ultrasonic device. So it is low on sensitivity, but high on specificity. So it is a cheaper device, but not the best way of identifying osteoporosis. Okay. Going on our next question from Raju Srivastava. Mm -hmm. Is osteoporosis reversible? For example, if a patient starts exercising and takes supplements of calcium citrate and vitamin D3, will the bone density increase or does it only decrease the rate of disease progression? Uh, very, very good question. We are basically uh, fighting against a disease which is related to related to age wherein you are looking at a catabolic phenomena and we are trying to fight it uh, by the use of uh, medicines in the, either in the form of vitamins and calcium intake and, uh, and exercises. So yes, uh, medicines uh, like calcium vitamin D do help to uh, improve the quality of the bone. Exercises does help uh, to reverse it, but uh, can it reverse, this, uh, reverse it completely? Possibly not. And in patients who have well-established osteoporosis, you have to look at things much beyond just exercise and calcium vitamin D to reverse the osteoporosis. And that is where the role of either bisphosphonates or uh, teriparatide comes into picture. Next question from Karuna. What preventive measures do you recommend for youngsters to not have osteoporosis? Okay, that's a very good question. So, uh, live a healthy lifestyle. Again, this is a very general statement. That means uh, optimal weight, regular exercises, uh, adequate amount of calcium, vitamin D in your diet. Uh, stay away from uh, soft drinks, especially aerated soft drinks which have a lot of caffeine. Uh, do not smoke and uh, use alcohol if at all in moderation. That does not mean that I am justifying the use of alcohol, but if at all you are using it, use it in moderation. Question from Sana again. Mm -hmm. What stages of osteoporosis is calcium and vitamin D prescribed? Or are they prescribed as preventive measures? How do we so, differentiate in what cases how do we differentiate in what cases to prescribe calcium and which cases vitamin D? Okay, so for so it's it's a fairly kind of a longish question. So calcium and vitamin D in optimal doses needs to be given to all patients, irrespective of whether they have osteoporosis or not. For a for a healthy individual, he needs to take it through his diet. But for patients who are already in the osteoporosis category, we need to supplement it by using uh, your supplements uh, in the form of tablets. So that, that answers the first part of the question. I think the second part of the question uh, was, do we need to uh, give it to patients who have osteoporosis? Yes, because if we are going to uh, use medicines which are either going to form bone, we need to provide them with some substrate over which the bone is going to be formed. Uh, now, do all of us need to take calcium supplements? The answer is, if our diet can offer us 1000 milligrams of calcium every day and about 600 international units of vitamin D every day, then we don't need to take tablets. But if our diet is going to involve uh, uh, lack of these these uh, nutrition nutrients, then we need to take those supplements. 
I hope I answered all the aspects of the question. Yes. Uh, next question from Mukul. If the patient already on biphosphonate therapy made the fracture, does this impact fracture healing? And how you manage such patients? Now, is the fracture because of osteoph osteoporosis? So, is it a fragility fracture? Or is it a fracture which is because of a normal trauma? Needs to be understood. Now, the fact that the patient is on bisphosphonate therapy suggests that the patient was probably dealing with a situation where the patient had osteoporosis. And uh, having said that, when we are looking at fracture healing, we need to offer uh, the patient, uh, we need to offer patients uh, this, the options which can help with bone formation rather than bone breakdown. Now, as I have mentioned in my study, there are, uh, in, my, in my talk, there are some studies which suggest that the bisphosphonates can hamper the maturation of the bone mass. And that is where refraining from using bisphosphonates in the early period of fracture healing, that is the first three months, may be important. And that is where we need, need to look at alternative options, which, which possibly could include deriperatide and calcium vitamin D supplements. Question from Saraswata. Mm -hmm. Is women's horlicks useful for osteoporosis? Mm -hmm. uh, women's horlicks? Yes. She's asking, uh, is women's horlicks useful for osteoporosis? I wish I, I would know the, uh, the constitution of the horlicks. It is a commercial product, so I am... I, am, I may not be able to kind of uh, define as to what is the content of calcium and vitamin D in that. But what I would say is uh, as long as you are taking milk, that itself is a good source of ca uh, calcium. And if you have vitamin D being provided by the uh, Horlicks or whatever preparation it is in optimal amount, uh, you are uh, just getting your job done. And that is what is important. Next question from Rashmi. When is the greatest loss of bone density for the majority of women? Is it right at menopause, the first year after, or five years after that? So the first five years after the menopause is when they, uh, they start losing bone. And I think the first five to ten years are very crucial, and that is when uh, they tend to ignore this phenomena. Typically, they present to, to, to us or a doctor beyond 55, 60 when a lot of bone is already lost. So uh, the first couple of years after the menopause are the, are the years when you can actually offer them optimal dose of calcium vitamin D, promote exercises, and maintain their bone uh, strength in the normal range. OK. Next question from Shipra. What is the current thinking? on how much calcium to take and what kind is best absorbed. Also, what about strontium? Strontium? Uh, so, uh, current thinking, you should be taking, a nat ideally you should be taking a natural source of calcium. So, milk, milk products, uh, nuts, ragi, uh, paneer, cheese are the normal sources of calcium. If you can take it in an adequate amount, that is the best way to go. If not, then you should be looking at a source which can provide you about 1000 milligrams of elemental calcium every day. Now, is the calcium citrate valued better or is the calcium, uh, uh, different calcium, or coral calcium better? I really don't know and I really don't have strong studies to support that. I think the cheapest source of calcium should be uh, your source of calcium as long as it is in the optimal amount. As for the strontium, it, it is one of the, uh, it is one of the, uh, options in the treatment of osteoporosis, but my experience of using calcium uh, or strontium is uh, very limited and I would refrain from commenting uh, much about that. I would rather uh, pass it on to an uh, endocrinologist in terms of uh, the use and the specific indications. Okay, uh, next question with no name written here. I am 25 years old with severe osteo osteopenia and a T score and Z score of minus 2.3. If I take mm -hmm. enough supplements, can I change this value, prevent osteoporosis, and increase bone density? Uh, answer is yes, but 
partly yes because uh, if your p score is minus 2.3 i need i think you need to look at uh, certain other things like uh, use of this phosphonates to improve your t scores and okay. if you are just 25 then if you are just 25 then i would be a bit curious as to why your t score should be uh, minus 2.3 in which case i would rather repeat that uh, the bmd at a very standard uh, on a very standard machine and uh, confirm whether the t score is actually minus 2.3 and if it is so then i would rather get some investigations done before actually going in for treatment because at 25 i don't expect the t score to be minus 2.3 Yeah, next question. Can you prevent osteopenia from becoming osteoporosis without taking supplements if you are on a vegetarian diet? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, if you are on a vegetarian diet, then you need to optimize your intake of, uh, uh, of, food, of food articles which contain calcium and vitamin D. Uh, and that means a lot of intake of milk, milk products, uh, and certain other things. So meeting a nutritionist may be a good idea so that uh, you do not leave anything for chance. Next question. What are medication options other than biphosphonates? Uh, for which category? There's no category okay. written here. Okay, so again, bisphosphonates can be used in all categories, but they are the most effective in uh, in patients who have a T-score of minus uh, minus one to minus two point five. But patients who are beyond minus two point five, uh, you need to treat them with something more, which basically includes teriparatide or forty or what is it, what it is commonly called. And patients who have a better T-score, like minus say minus one or minus zero point eight, then you can just do with calcium vitamin D supplements or uh, improve nutrition and exercise. Taking our last question, question from Abhay. What is the current thinking about nutrition and bone density? Is there concern about over prescribing calcium without mm -hmm. enough vitamin, vitamin D and K2? How significant is magnesium and other minerals as part of the big picture? Okay, so that's a very interesting question. Yes, there is an over prescription of calcium and vitamin D. As I rightly said, for someone who's taking a balanced diet, we don't need to take supplements. But uh, we are far away from uh, that ideal uh, utopic, uh, utopian uh, concept of taking a balanced diet. Uh, we are all uh, surviving on junk food. We are having a lot of preparations which, which are uh, nutritionally unsound, and that is where supplements come into the picture for the high risk category. As far as the use of zinc, magnesium, and certain other micronutrients nutrients is concerned, it is important that these are a part of the supplementation, and that is where having a balanced product comes into the picture. So having uh, use of multivitamins. Uh, on periodic basis is useful and when you have all these nutrients going in an adequate amount that means adequate amount of calcium as well as vitamin D is when you are going to get an effect of what you are consuming just giving calcium is not going to take you from, from point A to point B so uh, so uh, we need to understand that uh, it is it is getting the balance either the balance diet or providing balanced amount of supplements is the key to, to achieving uh, optimal nutrition.